Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Hardware.io weekly webinar. My name is Antriksh, and I'm part of the Hardware.io team. At Hardware.io, we are creating a platform where we brainstorm ideas to defend and attack various hardware devices. We have been running a conference in the Netherlands and US, which revolves around key concerns related to embedded attacks, backdoors, firmware, and related protocols. Cloud computing is the most prominent today, and we all should be aware on who has access to our data on the cloud. But we are not going to talk about that today. Cloud computing has something called as a hypervisor that enables sharing of single hardware to multiple users. A user having a privileged access has also that access to the direct memory of the virtual machine. While data can be protected with disk encryption, but data on memory is open for malicious hackers. Our speaker today, Robert, who's a security researcher and firmware reverse engineer pursuing PhD at TU Berlin, is going to talk to us about analyzing AMD secure encrypted virtualization and remote attestation. So let's welcome Robert to deliver his talk today. A quick announcement, guys. Uh, the format for the con uh, today's session would be 30 minutes of Robert's presentation, followed by 10 minutes for Q&A. If you have any question, please use the Zoom chat to type in your question, and Robert would answer them after his presentation is complete. So Robert, over to you. So, thanks for the introduction. Um, so what I'm gonna to present today is my work on the secure encrypted virtualization technology and specifically on its remote attestation feature. Um, this work was uh, done together with my master's student, Christian Werling and Professor Jean-Pierre Seifert. And we presented this uh, in November at the Computer and Communications Security uh, Conference. Um, today, I'm going to first introduce SEV as it's uh, a technology that maybe not everyone knows. And then I will go over how the remote attestation feature works and what its weaknesses are. All right. So I guess everyone knows this term that the cloud is just someone else's computer. But what does that really mean uh, in terms of security? Well, if we look at one host of such cloud systems, we see that there usually is a software uh, running at a high privilege level called the hypervisor. And the hypervisor is provided by the cloud provider and is responsible to share the resources among different tenants. Now, each of those tenants um, should be separated from another um, as they might belong to different customers. Now, in such an environment, if you as the customer of a cloud environment want to protect your data, you could protect the data at rest. So you can use disk encryption technologies inside the cloud. There's no problem there. Um, for data in transit, so when it's transferred over network, for example, you can use you know, TLS or something like that. And this works perfectly fine in the cloud environment. However, the data in use, so at runtime, is unprotected if you consider the hypervisor as the adversary because the hypervisor has direct access to the virtual machine's memory and can simply read out all the content. So in terms of the usefulness of encryption technologies in the cloud environment, if you consider the hypervisor as the adversary, uh, well, this encryption does not really make sense because the keys are used inside the virtual machine and are accessible within the virtual machine's memory. Robert, your voice is quite low. Could you speak loudly? Sorry? Uh, the, your audio is quite low. All right. Is it better now? Much better. All right. Okay. Sorry for that. So um, inside the cloud environment, if you consider the hypervisor as the adversary, um, disk encryption does not really make sense because the key corresponding for the, uh, to the disk encryption is used within the memory of the virtual machine and can be easily read out by the cloud provider. So it can just 
simply access all the data, even if the disk is encrypted. Now, AMD tries to solve that problem. They uh, introduced a technology called secure encrypted virtualization. And from the white paper, they say the SCV technology is built around a threat model where an attacker can potentially execute malware at the higher privileged hypervisor level as well. So SCV actually tries to protect your virtual machine from a potentially malicious hypervisor. So how does that work? Well, SCV adds memory encryption with keys which are unique per virtual machine. Now, the keys are generated and used by the dedicated secure processor, which is part of the x86 die. The secure processor runs a firmware provided by AMD, and the keys used inside that secure processor are not accessible by the hypervisor. So now your disk encryption keys, for example, are safe because when they are in use inside the virtual machine's memory, they're encrypted and the hypervisor can no longer access them directly. But this is not enough because as the cloud customer, you also need to be, an, you need some assurance that the virtual machine was actually instantiated with SV protection in place. So you need to have some proof that SV is actually enabled. Um, and also you need to provide a secret to the virtual machine. So for example, the disk encryption key, where does it come from? You as the cloud customer need to be able to provide that key to the virtual machine in a secure manner. So SCB has some solutions for that too. The cloud customer um, is able to establish a secure channel directly with the target host, specifically to the secure processor of the target host. Um, the secure processor will generate a hash of the virtual machine's memory content, and that hash is provided to the customer. So now the customer can verify that the virtual machine was actually set up as the customer specified it. Now, if that checks out, the customer can use the same secure channel to inject a secret directly via the secure processor into the encrypted virtual machine's memory. So this key is at no point in time accessible by the hypervisor. It is protected at all times. Now, for this remote attestation and key injection feature, there are a bunch of keys involved, which I'm gonna explain now. So this is a simplified overview of the keys which are used inside SCV. They're actually uh, a bit more. So on the secure processor, we have a key which is called the platform Diffie-Hellman key. Now this key is used to establish a protected communication from the customer to the secure processor. And this key is derived on the secure processor by its firmware from a random number. So once you boot up the AMD system for the first time, the firmware will derive this PDH key. Now, the public part of that key is exported to the customer. So that's something the you as the customer need to get from your cloud provider. Then the PDH is signed by a so-called chip endorsement key, the CEK. The CEK is also derived on the platform within the secure processor. However, it is derived from a chip unique secret. So for each AMD CPU with SEV support, this secret is different. And corresponding to that secret, there's a unique ID. So this platform specific ID is also exported to the customer. Now the customer will take that ID and query an AMD key server. Within the AMD key server, AMD has a list of all the secrets. AMD will then derive the same CK for the target platform sign that CK with an AMD root key and the exported uh, and the uh, public parts of those keys are then again exported to the customer. So now what the customer has in its hand is a certificate chain from the PDH over the CK to the RAK. And if the PDA, PDH is now used to establish a secure channel, the customer can be ensured that this is an authentic AMD system which has the SEV feature. 
Now, it's important to note here that the CK, the chip endorsement key, is the only link between AMD and the target platform. Now, we took, and, uh, we took the firmware and analyzed it, how exactly the CK is derived. So the first question is, where can we find the firmware for the secure processor? Now, the secure processor itself is actually an ARM Cortex-A5, which resides within the x86 die. Now, the firmware for that is stored alongside the usual UEFI firmware. So if you take an UEFI uh, image from an Epic server, within that image, you find the PSP firmware. Um, the PSP firmware has a dedicated file system and it's a non-standard file system. It's provided by, uh, implemented by AMD. And we developed a small tool called PSP tool, which would allow you to parse that file system information. So if you're interested in uh, looking at this file system, you can have a look at the, our GitHub homepage, you find the tool there. Um, what you see here is roughly one third of the files which are present for an AMD Epic system. Now for it, us today, they're just two of interest right now. There is an AMD public key which is stored inside the UEFI image and a component called the PSP FW bootloader. Now, when the system boots up, the first thing that boots before the x86 core is the PSP. And on the PSP, we have an on-chip bootloader, which is stored in non-updatable ROM. Now, the on-chip bootloader will first load the AMD public key from the UEFI flash image, which is attached via SPI. Um, it will then verify uh, its hash and compare it to a fixed hash stored inside the on-chip bootloader. Now, if that succeeds, it will continue and load the PSPFW bootloader component. And then it verifies its signature using the previously loaded AMD public key. And for SEV in the last step, the execution is handed over to the PSPFW bootloader, which at the end will load an application. We call it the SEV application. And this is the firmware application which uh, handles all the SEV related uh, keys and functionality. And this application is also verified using the same AMD public key. Now, we discovered some bugs in that firmware. Mm. So let's think about what, the, what an attacker can do with such a system. So we have access to the SPI flash. And on that SPI flash, we have the firmware file system. And what can we do with it? Now, the firmware file system consists basically of uh, directories which have a header and entry. And an entry has a fixed ID, an address, and the size value. Now, uh, such an entry can point to a specific file, or it can point to a secondary directory, so a directory within a directory. Now, um, if we look at the files, we see that they have a header, a body, and a signature. So if we would manipulate the files themselves, this won't work because they're protected, the firmware will verify its signature, the signature check would fail, and the system would refuse to boot. But what we can actually do is we can manipulate the directories because they're not protected at all. So for example, what we can do is we can add additional entries to this directory structure, or we can uh, remove entries. Um, we can change entries. So, uh, this entry here, which points to a secondary directory, it has a size value. We can change that size. So usually that size uh, refers to the size of the secondary directory. We can ch simply change that size and make it smaller without actually removing any of those entries. So this is all stuff that an attacker can do. So let's have a look what could go wrong. Now, there's a dedicated directory called the PSP directory which among other things contains the reference to the AMD public key, which is used to authenticate all applications. Um, this directory also contains a reference to a secondary directory. Now, when the on-chip bootloader starts initializing the system, the on-chip bootloader will take this directory and set up a so-called boot ROM service page, 
This is a dedicated memory page within the CK processor, which is used to communicate um, data from the on-chip bootloader to the off-chip bootloader. So the on-chip bootloader will populate that page with data, and later on the off-chip bootloader makes use of that data. So the on-chip bootloader actually places the entries of the first directory on that bootroom service page. Um, also part of the bootroom service page is the AMD public key. So the AMD public key itself is not again read by the off-chip bootloader from the SPI flash. It is just read once by the on-chip bootloader placed in memory. And from now on, this AMD public key is used to authenticate all the applications. Now, later on, when the off-chip bootloader is executing, the off-chip bootloader will append entries of the secondary directory. So it, it merges those two directories to one big directory on the bootroom service page. Now, I guess you can also already see what issues might occur when merging those directories, right? Because we have the AMD public key right below the space reserved for the two directories. So what could possibly go wrong here? Now, we have room for exactly 64 entries on that bootroom service page before we hit the AMD public key. So the off-chip bootloader should better verify that it does not copy more than 64 entries, right? And indeed it does. So if you look at the, uh, at the code of the off-chip bootloader, we see some security check like this, essentially. So if the number of entries exceeds 64, the firmware will return an error and stop booting the system. Well, the issue is that this number of entries refers to the entries of the secondary directory. So essentially, this check enforces that whatever is within the secondary directory must not exceed 64. But on the bootroom service page, we already have data from the first directory there. So this security check only enforces whatever we append here has a maximum of 64 entries. And you can already see that the AMD public key is well within that range of 64 entries. So what an attacker can do is it places his own, aim, uh, his own public key within the directory structure of the secondary directory. Now the off-chip builder will copy the entries on the bootroom service page and will happily continue copying data uh, as long as it does not hit the uh, maximum of 64 entries. So our own public key fits within that range and that gives us the opportunity to replace the public key inside this bootroom service page. So from now on, every application which is loaded by the off-chip bootloader is authenticated using our own key, our own public key. So that means we can sign user space application on this secure processor now. So how does that relate to SEV? Now, the SEV application is one of those applications on the secure processor which is loaded after this public key has been overwritten. So now we control this public key. That means we also control the SEV application. So we can provide our own SEV application, our own implementation of SEV if we want. Um, it's interesting to note that the secure processor does not implement rollback prevention. So if we find a system which has a firmware which has been updated to the newest version, it does not really matter, right? We can always flash an old firmware version which has this bug and then mount our attack. So how does that relate to remote attestation? Now, as I said previously, the CEK, the chip endorsement key, is the only link between AMD and the target platform. Now, the way the CK is derived on the platform is as follows. The um, PSPFW bootloader component acts as a small operating system and it reads a secret from a fuse and then it provides that secret as is to the SEV application, which is now controlled by us. Now, the SEV application will then derive the CK and with yeah, then derive the CK. So now we can extract the CK and according to the AMD SEV API specification, the CK 
exists for the lifetime of the platform. So that means we can extract a CK, then flash again a new firmware version without any bugs, whatever, the CK is still valid. It's still the same CK for that specific uh, processor. So this CK does not depend on any firmware versions. And yeah, as I said, as if we extract it, it's still valid after the firmware issues have been fixed. Now, this is the only link between the platform and AMD. So if we control the CK, we can actually create our own PDH, our own key, which is used to authenticate a remote SEV platform. Now, what can we do with that? Well, we can do a lot of things, but one really nasty thing is what I call the migration attack. So um, in a cloud scenario, customers want to be able to migrate their virtual machine from one host to another for example, to ensure load balancing or to ensure high availability of guests. Now, migration of a virtual machine usually also uh, requires the copy of the memory content. Now, with SEV, the memory itself is actually encrypted and the key is stored inside the secure processor. So the hypervisor could copy the encrypted memory from host A to host B, but the corresponding key is not copied. So this memory is useless on the target machine. So that's why AMD SCB has a dedicated uh, procedure to uh, migrate virtual machines from one host to another. Um, with SCV migration works as follows. The source host of the migration process and the target will establish a secure channel between their corresponding secure processes. And this secure channel is authenticated using the same certificate chain I explained earlier. Now the source host will then re-encrypt the virtual machine's memory using a transport key. And this transport key is shared between the secure processors of the two hosts. And then the memory can be transferred and the target host can re-encrypt the virtual machine's memory using a fresh key. So now the virtual machine's memory has been transferred from host A to B, but the actual memory content was never readable in plain text for anyone who's a man in the middle, for example. And uh, none of those initial memory encryption keys from host A leak uh, to the hypervisor, for example, because they're never transferred actually. So um, we control part of the certificate chain now that is used to authenticate a remote AMD system. So what we do now as the attacker is, we initiate a migration process with a target host. This gives us this transport key and will ensure that the source host of the migration process will re-encrypt the virtual machine's memory using the transport key, which we got now. Now, now we have the encrypted memory, but also the key. So we simply can unlock the memory encryption, uh, the, the memory content of the virtual machine and read out all its data. And what makes this so, so nasty, I would say, is that any valid CK is sufficient so I go to eBay, I buy one of the SCB, app, uh, SCB capable uh, secure, uh, processors, I extract a CK, and then I can go to an arbitrary other machine and initiate this migration process, and it will work. So the target host does not need to be vulnerable at all. There is no firmware issue in the target host here. And me as the attacker, I don't need to have physical access to the target machine. I don't need to flash any firmware there or make use of any firmware issues. I just need to be able to initiate this migration process. So for example, any administrator of a cloud provider is able to do that. And the only thing that a guest owner really can do is to mark his virtual machine as non-migratable. So with SCB, it's possible that you instantiate a virtual machine in a way that it's never migrated. Then the whole process of migration will never happen. But of course, then you lose some of the capabilities of a cloud system. Now, there is proof of concept code that does exactly that. So if you look at my, my GitHub, you, you find the scripts that will do that and then can look at the migration attack. Um, in our paper, we proposed some mitigations to the way the uh, SEV remote station feature works. 
So one of the core issues we explained is that we are able to make use of a firmware vulnerability to extract the CEK. Now, um, there is no rollback prevention. So just implementing rollback prevention would be a good thing, but it's not sufficient because the CEK is still valid after the new firmware has been installed. So we need a better way to make, uh, to and put the CEK. So what we try to change with our proposed design is to limit the lifetime of the CEK. So in the current specification, the CK exists for the lifetime of the platform. Uh, our design tries to change that. So we propose um, a scheme that involves multiple intermediate secrets. So when the first component on the on-chip uh, on the PSP boots, the on-chip bootloader, we propose that the on-chip bootloader derives a so-called secret uh, SPSP. And this is derived using a key derivation function which takes a few space secret and a version number of the component which is loaded next. In this uh, example, the PSP FW bootloader component. Now when the execution is handed over to the off-chip bootloader, the off-chip bootloader must only have access to this intermediate secret, the SPSP. It will take the SPSP together with, again, the firmware version of the next component, in this example, the SEV application. Now we'll, we'll take the SPSP and the firmware version and, again, use a KDF to derive another intermediate secret, the SCK. And then in the final step, the SEV application will derive the final CK using only this previously in a generated intermediate secret. So this kind of simple setup ensures that there now exists a valid CK for every firmware combination of a platform. And the lifetime of the CK is limited to the lifetime of the firmware components. And specifically, if we are able to extract a CK and then install a new firmware, the previously extracted CK is no longer valid because it was bound to a different firmware version. So how does that work? Oh, sorry. Um, this scheme is um, somewhat similar to uh, the device identifier composition engine, which is proposed by the Trusted Computing Group. In this scheme, also different stages of the boot process use, for example, the hash of the following stage as an input to a key derivation function. So this is somewhat similar. Um, and also, uh, in uh, last year, November, AMD proposed an update to their SCV uh, feature called SCV SNP, Secure Nested Paging. And one of those things they propose to change there is that they introduce a version chip endorsement key. And they say the VCK is based on the fuse chip unique value and is derived from TCB component versions. So somewhat similar to what we propose. Now, how does this new scheme work with this migration attack where we extracted a CK from a firmware version that was vulnerable? Now, um, in this example, a CK is bound to a specific firmware version now. So let's assume the target host has an updated firmware. Um, no security issues there. Um, an attacker now wants to extract the virtual machine's memory. The target host needs to have an CK of version 2.0. Now the attacker was able to extract a CK from a previous vulnerable version, let's say 1.0. So when the attacker provides that uh, keychain, the host can now validate that the CK is actually, or that the version of the CK actually matches a given minimum. So in this example, is the version of the CK actually 2.0 or greater? And if it's not, the uh, target host will simply de deny any further communication. So now this previously extracted CK can no longer be used to mount this attack. Um, so in summary, we showed that there are firmware issues which allowed us to extract the CK and that there is some issue with uh, no rollback prevention and the fact that the CK is uh, essentially valid for the lifetime of the whole uh, CPU. And the migration attack showed that attacks are possible with the CK even if the target host is not vulnerable at all. So 
the current design of SAP cannot cope with any firmware issues. Uh, however, as I've showed you, um, the upcoming SCV SNP feature tries to mitigate this issue by introducing uh, CK, which is bound to firmware versions. Um, yeah, so this is it from my side. And if you're interested in the uh, follow-up resources, uh, as I said, you find the migration attack uh, proof of concept code on my GitHub. And also we have a GitHub repository with uh, various uh, tools for the PSP itself. So if you're into PSP firmware reverse engineering, have a look at our PSP reverse repository on, on GitHub. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Robert. I see you've timed your talk perfectly fine for 30 minutes, so that's great. Um, mm -hmm. Audience, if you have any questions, uh, please ask. Uh, there is one, is there any platform currently in the market using this technology and what is your opinion? Will this technology become more widespread in the near future? So Amazon recently announced, or was it Google? Sorry. Huh. One of them recently announced that they will offer SAV protected virtual machines for customers. Um, I'm quite sure that they only use Zen 2 based um, Epic CPUs because this firmware issue I explained um, earlier is only present on the first generation Zen CPUs. And the CK which we, we extracted is bound to an AMD root key which is specific for Zen 1 CPUs. So to the best of my knowledge, if you use this feature on a Zen 2 system, there is no way you can exploit it using the bugs I explained uh, earlier. So in that sense, I think it will become more widespread in the future. All right. Uh, I have one question, Robert. Uh, have you seen similar issues with other platforms like ARM or Intel? Sorry, with what? Have you seen similar issues, security issues with other platforms like ARM or Intel? Um, well, the thing is right now there is no other vendor that claims to have technology that is, uh, well, that provides protection from a potentially malicious hypervisor. So, uh, well, SGX is there, but SGX only protects small enclaves and not a whole virtual machine. So um, Intel has some memory encryption for virtual machines. At least they proposed some of that. Um, but I don't think they actually try to protect from a malicious hypervisor. So in that sense, no, I've just looked at AMD and not at other platforms. Uh, I'm sure uh, AMD must have responded back to it with a preventive measure. So have you, do you have any idea on what are their ways to succumb it or prevent this issue? So for Zen 1, there is, to the best of my knowledge, again, no way to prevent this because um, there is no warlock prevention and you can always go and look for vulnerable firmware versions and then UEFI update, flash it, extract the CK and then use that CK. Um, for Zen 2, they greatly enhanced their security measures in the firmware. It's still the same firmware basis, but I've looked at it and it looks like they did a way better job in protecting the firmware. Um, but Zen 2 has the same setup of SAV. So if there were a security issue where you could extract a CK in Zen 2 systems, you can mount the same migration attack also on Zen 2 systems. And for the future, as I said, they plan to bind the CK to specific firmware versions which then allows a cloud provider to update their systems and tell the customers, okay, we updated, it's safe again now, uh, that will work. All right, fair enough. Uh, any other question from the audience? Okay, uh, well, 
Robert, I think that's it. There are no more questions, but uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, such valuable information that you've worked on. And uh, we hope to have you in the future with some new research of yours. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you audience for being with us today. Uh, we hope to see you for the next webinar, which is on the 13th, uh, securing your CAN protocol. So thank you so much everybody. And uh, until the next webinar, stay safe. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye Robert. <laughs>